Today, I want to take you on a tour of an anti-fragile property that I built and implemented a number of years ago. So an anti-fragile system is a system that actually improves with volatility. Imagine if you had some thing that you wanted to ship across the country and it was anti-fragile. The label would actually say, apply volatility, create chaos. And in fact, anti-fragile elements don't only get better with volatility and chaos, they actually depend upon it. Now, most of our homes and acreages and farms are very fragile. If we lose power, they stop operating. If the diesel stops flowing, we can't farm them anymore. We could look at any of those supply chains and we could characterize them as either fragile, resilient, or anti-fragile. And so today I'm gonna to take you around to the food, energy, water, and shelter systems on this property and talk about how each individual one makes this property anti-fragile. In North America, our power grids are quite old and they're actually quite fragile. It's amazing actually how well they work given how old the infrastructure is. In our modern lifestyle, we depend upon electricity for almost everything that we do. So one of the design constraints for this property was to make sure that we had a redundant supply of electricity in the event of a long duration grid outage. We have very, very different uh, durations of sunlight in the summer compared to the winter. So in the summertime, it's going to produce way more than we use in the household on a day-to-day -day basis. And in the wintertime, this should produce about what the house uses on a typical day. And so the vertical angle optimizes for solar gain in the winter time. The middle angle optimizes for both summer and winter. And the top angle optimizes for summertime. And so instead of having an expensive ground mount solar system, we decided to use this building because it was perfectly oriented to south. And for the amount of money that we would put into a ground mount system, we were able to buy more panels. One thing that people don't realize about solar panels is that if you have a grid connected array, meaning that these solar panels produce power for your house, and when there's too much, it will actually send it back into the grid, is that when the grid goes down, the solar panels stop producing energy. And the reason they do this is that if the grid goes down, they want to be absolutely certain that nobody is generating electricity back into the grid so that they get electrocuted. This system, however, has specialized switch gear, and if it, the switch gear senses that the grid is down, it creates an island and shuts the property off, disconnects it from the grid, which allows these panels to continue operating and producing energy regardless of what's going on in the grid. The way that the grid works here in Saskatchewan is that the grid operator will actually account for how much power gets sent back on an annual basis. And so you end up having a bit of a bank account where in the summertime you overproduce and you store credits essentially for the winter time. And so having a dual direction meter allows you to keep your power cost really low. Now we have three layers of redundancy in this system. So the first layer of redundancy is the solar array with the switch gear. The second layer of redundancy is a set of batteries in the basement. And the third layer of redundancy is a generator. The typical household will use about 30 kilowatt hours of electricity per day. These batteries represent approximately 30 kilowatt hours worth of electricity. So there's about one day worth of power stored in these two power walls. What's really interesting about lithium ion, you're able to draw these batteries down close to 90%, meaning that if you're buying 15 kilowatt hours of capacity, then you're going to be able to use the majority of that capacity versus other battery technologies like lead acid, where you can only use 50% of the capacity. These batteries claim to have over 10,000 cycles, meaning that if you cycled these batteries every single day, you'd get roughly 30 years worth of utility out of these two batteries. So this battery allows us to more effectively use the generator, allows us to store surplus solar energy, and it allows us to use the grid as a form of generator as well as it can also receive a charge from the grid. It really brings the whole hybrid solar grid backup system together. One of the criteria on this property was to be able to have a redundant supply of power for long durations of time should the grid go off and not come back on. And so this 10 kilowatt array is designed to turn on if there's no solar panel, the batteries in the house are drained, and the grid is off. What's really interesting about internal combustion engines, whether they're gas or diesel, is that they operate at peak efficiency around 80% load. If you operate your microgrid with just a generator and no batteries, then the generator would have to run 24 hours a day in order for you to have power whenever you want it. So in a grid down scenario, this might turn on for 
three hours, recharge the battery bank, and as soon as the battery bank is full, it shuts off, and then the house will run off of the batteries until they need to be recharged again. And so you can see the benefit of bringing the solar panels and the generator together is that on most days of the year, the solar panels are gonna contribute uh, a large majority of the power to the batteries, and then this will only be used as a backup supply in order to bring those batteries up to their peak capacity. So by combining this generator, the solar panels and the batteries and modeling it, we were able to determine that a modest amount of propane, two bullets, would provide a 20 year supply of fuel in the event that the grid shut off for a long period of time. And that's assuming that the owner inside of the house doesn't curtail their usage. So when you design a generator system for a property, you need to choose a fuel source. And there's really only four fuel sources that you can choose. So natural gas can be a good fuel. However, you're relying on another grid to be up and operational in the event of a grid down situation. Natural gas is probably a pretty good choice overall because you don't have to store fuel and the natural gas grid is quite a bit more resilient than the electrical grid is. Propane is what we chose to use for this particular property because it never goes stale. Propane is also really difficult to steal. So as long as these tanks stay intact, this fuel will be able to be used in hundreds of years from now should the need be required. Diesel is also another really good fuel that has a very long shelf life. However, in rural areas, diesel fuel theft is quite prominent. And lastly, gasoline is not a great option because gasoline tends to go stale quite quickly. In addition to electricity, we also have to think about the thermal requirements of a house in order for it to be anti-fragile. In these northern climates like Saskatchewan, Alberta, BC, it can get really cold in the winter time, like down to minus 40 for a couple of weeks. And so if you want a house to be thermally resilient or anti-fragile, we need to think about other ways to bring heat into the building. Now the first trick, reducing the amount of energy that the building uses. This building does that in a number of ways. Number one, we have a lot of insulation in the attic and the exterior walls have had additional insulation installed on them. And we've also air sealed the building as well as high grade windows that reduce the heat loss. All four of these things go a long way in terms of keeping the thermal energy inside of the building and reducing heat loss. Air infiltration in a building is the amount of air moving between the inside and the outside of the building. And so by adding an air barrier, we can reduce that air movement, which can lead to some of the largest heat losses in a building. The windows in the building are actually one of the weakest links from a thermal perspective. So having a really good windows in the building makes a really big difference. So if we're able to build a house from scratch, we can also orient the house properly towards south so that it becomes a passive solar house and it's able to provide the majority of its heat by the sun that it collects through the windows. And so windows no longer become just something to look out of, they actually become your primary heating device for a building in a place that gets cold like Saskatchewan but also has a lot of sun. Once we've minimized the heat coming out of the building, we can start finding new and novel ways to bring heat into the building. And so behind me, we have a solar thermal array. So this uses a vacuum tube that allows sunlight to come in and heat an inner heating element. So it's a very efficient way of collecting solar energy. One of the biggest challenges that you face when you're trying to build your anti-fragile homestead is dealing with wind. Wind is exceptionally detrimental on plant growth. And so if you're trying to grow all of your food, making sure that you have a sheltered area for your food to grow is really important. So having wind blow against your building when it's really cold outside can increase the heat loss of your building by up to 50%. And so shelter belts like this one are really important in both keeping the wind load down on your vegetables as well as reducing the wind load on your buildings. Most cities have on average about three days of food at any given time in all of the warehouses. And if that wasn't bad enough, over the last hundred years, the nutrient density of our food has dropped precipitously. Food, energy, water, shelter, um, all of these things that make up a high quality of life are really what we're talking about in the systems that we're designing. You need to have water in order to grow food. You need to have energy in order to heat your house. You need to have food to be able to energize your body. And so all of these things have been relegated over the last hundred years to centralized systems. So let's go into this garden and have a peek at some of the production that's going on in here. And you can see how easy it is to grow enormous amounts of food in a very small space. 
This garden can provide food for five people throughout the summer. It's also packed with plants that produce storage crops that are great to grow so that you can eat through the winter. And it can comfortably produce enough storage crops to feed the same number of five people through the winter, which was one of the client's requirements. One of the first things to notice about this garden is it's surrounded by a deer fence. And when you're living rurally, that's really important because there's lots of other creatures that want to eat the same food that you do. It's always amazing to me how much you can grow in such a small space. Carrots are an interesting crop because they just get better through the season. They really benefit from a frost because the, the sugar ends up going into the carrot and they just get sweeter as time goes on. In-ground growing is also a necessity in my opinion when we're trying to run massive surpluses in our gardens for food storage. These crops tend to be a little bit more storage oriented. We've got lots of squash, we've got potatoes, more carrots. One of my favorite crops in a garden are plants that just keep coming back over and over again. So this is called a walking onion or an Egyptian onion. And you notice that it's got these little onions growing on the end of the plant and that the stem is dead here. And so if you wait long enough, this will just fall off onto the ground and these onions will take root and they'll reproduce. And so given enough time, these onions would actually just take over the garden bed. One of the sayings that we have is work is just a failure in design. And so the more plants that self seed and just proliferate, the more abundance we can have. And there's a whole plethora of plants that we can partner with that will provide us with enormous amounts of food with very little effort. Before you can have food security from your garden, you need to have water security. So let's go talk about the different layers of water security that we built into this property in order to ensure that there's always a supply of water to grow food, to drink, and generally to keep things hydrated on this property. Most properties rely on one water source. So in cities, it would come from your municipal supply. And in a rural area, you're going to typically be relying on a well. And so this is the well for this property. It's a shallow well. Most wells on properties tend to have a high mineral concentration, meaning that when you use it to irrigate, it will end up leaving minerals behind. Over long periods of time, if you live in a climate that's really dry, those minerals will accumulate and eventually they'll salt the soil and you won't be able to grow in them anymore. Civilizations like Babylon relied upon the water from the Euphrates, ended up collapsing as a result of the minerals and salts in the water from the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. So if you're on a rural acreage and you have hard water, you may want to think twice about whether you want to actually irrigate with well water, which is why we want to think about other water sources for our irrigation. Rainwater is one of the lowest energy and cleanest forms of water of all of the water sources. And so they allow us to take surplus amounts of water when it's raining outside, harvest it off of a roof surface, and then get access to it at a later date. But there's a lot of really interesting things that happens inside of a rain tank that most people are not aware of. Rain tanks actually will form a biofilm on the inside layer of the tank. And so this looks like a slime layer almost. Research has been done in Australia to understand what's actually going on with these slime layers. Turns out that these biofilms that form on the inside of these tanks are actually a form of water treatment. And so when they've compared the water column inside of the rain tank to the biofilm layer and measured it for things like lead, cadmium, arsenic, and other toxins, it turns out that the biofilms have anywhere from 100 to 300,000 times the concentration of these metals contained within them because the biofilms are actively bioremediating the water. And so what you're looking at here is not just a storage vessel, but also a vessel that bioremediates the water and cleans it as a result of the water sitting inside of the tank. Now this particular rain tank has the ability to provide both drinking water, irrigation, and any of the other water requirements on the property, all from just harvesting off of a standard rooftop. Let me tell you about why ponds are absolutely amazing for anti-fragile properties. First, ponds create an opportunity to collect water. And so we always need water to grow food. We need water to fight fires. We need water to manage our landscapes. Water also creates an incredible amount of microclimate because it holds heat and it reflects light. And so it improves the growing conditions of your property. 
So as consultants, we get hired to come around and look at people's properties, their homes, their energy, water, and food systems, and we help them to think through whether they're fragile, resilient, or anti-fragile. And then once we've defined which state those systems exist within, we design systems that robustify them, and in fact, we actually make them anti-fragile. But it's not just about meeting our basic needs. It's about creating properties that are absolutely gorgeous, that are abundant, that are sanctuaries that we want to spend our lives in. If you're looking to design, build, and implement your own anti-fragile property and you're looking for information, check out our URL in the show notes down below. And if you're wanting to have a conversation with us to see if there's an opportunity to collaborate, please get in touch.